When he put that gun in my face, all I thought was, oh my God, he set me up. I never thought I could be set up. You know, he always said, if you pull a gun on somebody, you make sure you follow through it, or it's gonna come back to haunt you. For the first time ever, the man at the center of what the FBI called Operation Family Secrets. So I knew my father was different than a lot of the other fathers. Sure. The only way that this person is going to understand through, through physical violence or actually get rid of them if you know you're not going to get the money from trunk of his car at Kennedy Airport yesterday. The list of names grows longer. So there was a side to my father. If you knew about my father, you would love him. And then there was a third side of my father was a sociopathic killer that I learned years later. His preferred method of killing you was with a rope and a knife. He'd strangle you, and once he knew you were dead, he'd cut your throat from ear to ear. I got off that stand, I looked at my dad one last time long, I walked in another room, tears came out of my eyes. Okay, the hardest part is one part I am my father's protector, and the other part I'm my father's executioner. Three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to No Offense. Thank you for tuning in today. We really appreciate it. Uh, shoot us a subscription if you like this type of content. Uh, we have a great guest today. His name is Frank Calabrese Jr. Uh, he's a former mobster with the Chicago Outfit and the son of Frank Calabrese Sr. Um, a wild story. He turned informant and played a significant role in um, kind of taking down organized crime in Chicago. Um, we're super excited to walk him through, kind of walk you through his story today, hear about what he's done, and uh, it's it's incredible. So, Frank, thanks for coming on today. We really appreciate it and uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, I guess to, to kind of kick this off, I think it would be great to walk us through your childhood. And uh, I'm super curious, what was it like growing up in a home where your father was uh, part of organized crime? How, how was that oh, experience? It, well, first of all, a little thing that was different than Chicago mob from New York mob was that in Chicago, you weren't supposed to bring your kids into this life. In Chicago, they went way underground, really tried to shield themselves because of law enforcement. So I grew up in Grand and Harlem, Elmwood Park. A lot of my friends' fathers were also in the life. When we were kids, we really didn't know what our fathers did. We knew it was a little different, but and we really didn't care, you know, because it really didn't pertain to us. Uh, when Godfather came out in the early 70s, I started to get a little more of an idea, you know, in 74 going into high school, then I started to have more of an idea what my dad, what my dad did for a living. What made it feel different? How did you think it was different? Well, I mean, he, uh, what made it feel different? Uh, well, he was he didn't have a nine to five job. <laughs> you know, yeah. sometimes yeah. the FBI was sitting on the house. I guess that's what made it different. But inside the house, we were like a normal family. When my dad was young, he didn't bring the street in the home. He said, you don't bring the street in the home. It corrodes the family structure. So when we were young, really had a good childhood. Other than I knew my dad was a little different and he did some different stuff. Um, you know, one time I asked him in grammar school, dad, we're doing projects at school. They want to know what our fathers do. I really don't know what you do. He goes, I'm an engineer. I go, you drive trains? He goes, no, no, no. He says, I'm an operating engineer. So that was good enough for me. You know, I wasn't yeah. curious. Uh, you know, and we, you know, he, we had a lot of rules, you know, and uh, make your bed, you know, uh, and dinner at every night at five, turn the TV off, respect your elders, you know, you get in trouble, you know, I'm going to break your leg. So there was a lot of normal, <laughs> at least I thought it was normal, <laughs> those kids in the area, you know, um, you know, I went to a Catholic high school, Holy Cross. I lettered in two sports, football and basketball in 1980. I won the Chicago Golden Gloves undefeated. So, you know, I wanted to go away to college just like all my friends were going. I wanted to be a lawyer. I was infatuated with law. Unfortunately, that oh, wow. never happened. Wow. wow. No way. That's, that's really cool. I didn't know the law part. I also didn't know the Golden Glove part. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. I didn't see that before. That's really cool. When did you get introduced... Um I guess, was it high school when you started getting a grip on what was going on? And then did you start talking to your father about that? Or, or yeah. how did that whole thing well, happen? My dad, you know, I was getting into high school. My dad was teaching me about the streets. He always said, I'm going to teach you street smarts. You go to school and you learn book smarts. It will help you in life. So he started grooming me a little. He started giving me tests and tasks, you know, and, and some of the stuff I started doing at first was one of the first things I did was we had a bunch of adult bookstores, peak shows in the 70s and 80s. They were cash cows. You know, we used to bring in sometimes as much as $20,000 plus a week from these places. So I would go with my uncle to 
empty all the money every week. I also learned a little bit about sports booking because they had a sports booking operation. And then the biggest thing my family was known for in the 70s and 80s was loan sharking. In New York, they call it the big. In Chicago, we call it juice, high interest rate loans. We had one of the biggest operations on the street in the 70s and 80s. Most times, over a million dollars, very seldom under a million dollars on the street at any given time. Roughly charging on average about 10% a week, which five. Wow, 10% a week. a week? Oh my God. Wow. It's actually where I learned all my math, too. Um, <laughs> he's starting to teach me this stuff. And for me, it was like, be a good son, do this for your dad, and then um, and get back to what I wanted to do. You know, go play sports, hang with my friends. But the problem was the more he gave me to do, the better I was at it. And the more he started pulling me into this, even though it was against what he was supposed to do. And I really felt it was against his gut, too. But he started pulling me more and more into this. Yeah, it was probably like a natural progression, too, for him, maybe because he knew he could trust you type of thing. And he thought, you know, I'd rather keep it within, I would imagine, was his thought process. and definitely. Yeah, yeah. That's wild. I'm, so as you started getting, I mean, did you like doing some of the stuff that you were doing at the time? Yeah, or were the, you trying to really stay away and just be like, I'm just doing this to be a good son? Like, yeah, I, I really didn't care. You know, I did it. I had to do it. Sometimes it was more of a chore, you know, than an yeah. excitement. You know, we didn't stand on the corner by the park and say, hey, you know, we want to be gangsters someday. You know, how you do it? You know, every, it, it wasn't like that. Okay. Everything was very, very um, underground for the people that did do it. So I had to keep this from my friends because I couldn't tell my friends what I was doing. You know, this was like just between me, my dad and my uncle, you know, and the few guys that I would see. So, you know, my dad, we learned later because my story really is a family story. Okay, I say I was born into this life, because, but our family business was organized crime. On my Italian side, my dad and my uncle were both high ranking made members in the Chicago map. On my Irish side, my grandfather used to fight against uh, Al Capone. He was in an Irish gang called the O'Donnell gang that was in some historical shootouts. So that's why I always say I was born into this. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I really didn't get into it till after I got out of high school. So we realized years later through counseling, everything, me, my brothers, family members, that my dad had this phobia. He had this control issue that if he thought we went away and we were successful, that we would disown him and not love him no more. So he always tried to control us. He wouldn't allow us to go away to college. So when I ended high school, instead of going away to college, he goes, you can go to the junior college. I got you a good job with the city of Chicago with the water sewer department. He goes, and you're going to be my secret weapon at night. You're going to work with me. And that was mm-hmm. pretty much what my life was going to be when I got out of high school. How did you feel about that when he told you that? I wasn't real happy at first, but I also got handed a very high paying job. You know, I've always worked jobs too. So, you know, I worked I, I, in grammar school. I had paper route. You know, I started I started working at Armand's and Elmwood Park when I was 14 years old at freshman high school because all my friends worked. So, you know, I'm going to school. I'm working for my dad and my uncle. I'm working at Armand's a few days a week. And so me, it was always about a hustle, but just a legal hustle. When I got out of high school and, and I started realizing this was my life, I started to buy into it. But I didn't buy into the mob. I, I bought into my dad. I bought into family and loyalty. And I was really good at what I did. I learned from some of the best. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, it seems like it. Yeah, what, what was like the, the day-to-day of doing that? You know, like what, what were you to be doing at night per se? Or, and what, what were you doing if you were outside of work? Yeah, I know you mentioned you're going to the bookstores, maybe like some sports betting. And <clears throat> were you out there doing collections as well? Like what, what was your role in all of it? I was one, what I was doing was I wasn't doing too many collections before the end of high school. I would go with my dad sometimes and take rides when he did see people. But um, I was doing mostly book work for my dad, okay, because he had a big operation. And, um, but when I got out of high school, after a few years in, it started to become more day to day. It started to be meeting. So I would meet a lot of our guys on the street. I wouldn't meet actual customers. I would go out and meet the 10, 12, 14 guys we had giving out juice loans on a daily basis because we would collect from them every day, okay? Um, My father was very street smart. 
very street smart, you know. So I learned a lot from him, in a, in a, but, you know, I try to use it in a positive way now. But my day-to-day, they're all, my dad's always trying to see if you can go to the next level, okay? And one day, he came home from his night at work. I'm in my 20s, and he goes, we got to talk. So whenever we had to talk, we would go in the bathroom, turn the vents on, turn the water on. He said, remember I told you there's rules in the neighborhood, there's consequences if you don't follow them. I go, yeah, dad. He goes, we had to kill two guys tonight in Cicero. And he, and he described in detail how they blew them apart with shotguns because they broke the rules. Mm. The reason for this, I didn't know it at the time. I thought it was just my dad telling me about the street. He wanted to see if I was ready for the next level. He wanted to see if I was ready that he's telling me he's also a cold-blooded contract killer upon orders. So, you know, when I'm looking at my dad and he's telling me this, I was ready for this because this is my dad, okay? He's got my best interest in him, right? He's telling me this is the way to street it. Wow, as crazy as it is. There's rules. We got to follow these rules or this could happen. But you know what I was also thinking? Wow. I wonder what my friend's fathers were telling them about their day at work. I bet it was nothing like the story my dad just told me. And then I graduate. I graduated into arson. I graduated into uh, violence, extortion. Uh, Even at points down the line, starting to help plan and assist in murders. This was going to be my legacy, and I was good at it. That point, I bought into it. And when you buy into the street, there's a high and there's an addiction to the street, okay? You're, now you're out there and you're looking for that next score. So I'm out. I had a lot of different things going on. You know, when I was 23, I also had a nightclub, okay, with a, with a friend of mine. His uncle was, was a high-ranking member in the Chicago mob. We had, we had a nightclub, too. So I was always hustling, always hustling. Now, one of the biggest mistakes I made in my life by hustling and getting into all this was... In Chicago, drugs was a big no-no. If you did drugs or sold drugs, you were around the mob was automatic death sentence. In the really? 80s, once I bought into all this, everybody used to party on the weekends once in a while. The discos, powder cocaine was very popular. It was socially accepted. It was only supposed to be habit warming. So I party once in a while. But what caught my eye was some friends of mine that were selling it. They didn't party. And I couldn't believe the money they were. Knowing it was a death sentence, I put my own little crew of guys together and started selling. Problem was, don't get high on your own supply. I started partying. It became a problem in 1997 when I went to jail was the last time I ever partied. And I've been clean since. One of the most embarrassing things I've ever done from everything from this. Mm. Wow. I could imagine, like you were saying, it had to have been just like a... It had to have been a high when you kind of feel lawless, like you're above the law at some point, right? You're doing so many different things, and you kind of have a lot more access than most people, I could imagine. Yeah, it's yeah, there's perks feeling. to it, too, but you're also there's also a lot of victims that, um, you know, especially yeah. a lot of family members, you know. Uh, I, you know, in this life, I never suffered. You know who suffers? Your wife, your kids, your mother, people yeah. around you. But there is a high. There is a high. Well, there's yeah. a high. You know, I'd leave my house and, you know, I'd be being followed. I didn't know if it was DEA or FBI, organized crime. You know, I didn't know. You know, it was a daily challenge. When I left my house, I had a routine. I had to make sure that I wasn't being followed, you know. And I learned a lot of tricks from my dad, you know. First of all, use my mirrors without turning my head. I don't want them to know I'm looking for them, okay? Otherwise, they'll back off, get more sophisticated. If I could wear uh, sunglasses, wear sunglasses. In the movies, you see guys drive fast to lose them. I'd actually slow down, make a lot of turns using my turn signal, and I'd slowly get them to an area of all one-way and dead-end streets that I was very familiar with. And if I knew I was being followed, I'd know right away if I got you to that area. Sort of many, many tricks like that every day we would do. You know, never carried nothing in my hands, even if I had a McDonald's bag with food in it. I wouldn't carry it because if you did that, they might think there's something in the back and and give a reason to to pull you over. So there there was a lot of little tricks of the trade, but it was, it was a high every day, you know, and if you were being followed, just, it just ended your day, you know, go to the movie theater, go work out at the gym, go back home. You know, tomorrow's another day. Years later, when the FBI got stronger, we started doing stuff in the middle of the night because my dad's philosophy was the FBI's got to sleep sometime. 
So he, all we <laughs> want in the busiest time of day, meeting out on an intersection, it was under the cover of darkness, outside, constantly moving, switching the meat uh, spots weekly. So it was a lot to it. He was very street smart like that. And I learned a lot from him like that. Was that uh, being followed? Was that like an everyday occurrence, right? Once a week, like randomly? It was random. It was random. Yeah. You know, uh, it wasn't every day. You know, uh, usually if there was stuff going on, they usually have to get, if I'm not mistaken, they have to get permission to start following. And there's got to be something going on active, whether it's from an informant or something they seen for them to start following on a regular basis. It was a- so for... <clears throat> So I, I remember hearing that, like, so for a little, for a little while when it started out, your family was almost under the radar and like, they, they didn't fully know that you guys were, you know, a big part of like the Chicago outfit and everything like that. Is that, is that right? And, and how long did that go on for that? You guys were kind of under their radar. Well, in, in, in the seventies, when I was in high school, there, there was, um, the state's attorney was doing a lot of investigations and in when they and they put out this 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 orange book with the lower echelon and upper echelon on the Chicago map. My dad was in that book. My dad got big by giving money out. So we became on their radar. But all the way until I started cooperating, everybody thought we gave out money, a little bit of sports betting, and that was it. They had no idea. Mm-hmm. They didn't have any idea about me. Uh, people thought I just ran a few errands for my dad once in a while. My uncle, nobody knew about him. They thought he was just driving him around and he was almost, they used the word lackey. You know, it was just this, you know, hang around brother. Okay, when all this came out, and that wasn't until um, 1998 that all this came out. Even when we went to jail in 97, the government thought they had us and they hadn't even touched the tip of the iceberg. So for many years, people didn't know the extent, but that after a while, people knew that we, Mm -hmm. that my dad was involved, knew my uncle was involved, knew I ran errands for my dad. What what was it that, that got, what did they get you guys on in, in what, 97? So you said, or 98? Yeah. So what had happened is in the eighties, there was a guy in town and my dad liked him. He was a mechanic and he was kind of shady. He had gotten into drugs. He gotten into uh, stealing cars, doing a lot of shady stuff. And we used to hang by his uh, auto garage because my dad used to like to meet there thinking this guy was a straight laced guy. And he'd always tell the guy, don't do anything wrong. Otherwise, I'm not going to be around. Well, this guy started doing so much wrong and the FBI knew we were hanging there that they were watching him and they set him up. He stole 30-some cars, sold them to an undercover FBI agent, sold an automatic machine gun to an FBI agent, sold drugs. He did everything. So they said, all right, look, they pulled him in a room one day, and they says, all right, look, we're the FBI. You're in trouble. We just need you to do one thing. He says, what? We want you to uh, tell us about your boss. My boss, Frank Calabrese. Frank Calabrese, oh, man, he's going to kill me. He didn't know nothing about it. So then he had to work with them for a while. And it was kind of a shitty case, but in, in, um, in ninth, it was, this case, it was the last day of the statute of limitations. Statute of limitations are 10 years. Um, in, in 1995, in July, we got arrested, me, my dad, my uncle, my brother, about seven or eight other crew members for running a loan sharking racket from 78 to 92 through threats, intimidation, and violence. So it was an old case. It was a weak case. So when we all got arrested, you know, um, you're looking at, do I plead guilty and take a lesser time or do, or do I fight it and get way more time? So you're looking at, if I fight it, I'm looking at 10 to 12 years, but if I plead guilty, non cooperating I get five years and $125,000 fine at that time in 95, I'm thinking I got two little kids. Am I going to see him out of high school or am I going to see him in three to five years? It's obvious probably what to choose at that point, right? But that must have been a really difficult decision. (laughs) Well, there's a lot more in between there to that point. So, um, you know, 
as I got deeper with my father and my uncle into it, if you guys ever seen the movie Casino where the Spalachos got killed in the cornfield, that was in 86. Yep. My uncle was part of the hit team that went to Vegas to try to kill him. And he was also part of the hit team that killed him in the basement in Bensonville. That's where they really got killed. My dad was recouping from surgery at the time. Things were getting really bad at that time on the street. The mob was getting more paranoid because the government was getting stronger, coming after people. And this life started to change my dad. When I say it's changed your dad, you know, when you're on the street, it's like military, it's like law enforcement. You have two personalities, okay? You have a street personality and a home personality. You don't bring that street personality in a home and treat your family like you would on the street. On the street, we, kindness could be weakness. At home, you could be kind. What happens to a lot of people when you're doing this for so long, because you've got to have two personalities, that's how you survive in this life. They start, for some people, they start blending together. And my dad started blending together. Three personalities. If you met the good side of him, he was a great man. When we were young, he was very generous, fun to be around. The middle personality he was very street smart and manipulative. The third personality was he was a sociopathic killer. His, his preferred method of killing you was with a rope and a knife. He'd strangle you, and then when he knew you were dead, he'd cut your throat from ear to ear. Okay, he was convicted of 13 murders of that, and he also did a lot more. So these personalities are starting to change. And I'm starting to see this, and my dad is not the man that I thought he was anymore. He's losing it. My uncle sees it. My brother sees it. Family member sees it. And we're concerned. There's only one man in life I ever feared that was my dad. I respect what other men are capable of. But that's the only man I feared. And... I didn't know, there was a point where I didn't know if I wanted to do this anymore. I got businesses, I'm making money, I got a good job. I don't know if I want to do this. And it came down one night to um, my dad. This was the final straw. He, uh, we stopped doing the book work at home because the government got stronger. We did it in the middle of the night, once a week. And then I go right from there, from three o'clock in the morning, we get it done about six, I go right to work. Then I go to one of my businesses, what well, night I'm late. I get there, I'm coming down the stairs, the bottom step, sorry I'm late, Dad. Bam, he hits me in the head. I go down, he's on me, beating me, and my uncle's running towards me. Now, my first thought is, what's going on? Did my dad found out I'm selling the drugs? Is he going to kill me? I'm scared. But instead of my uncle coming and joining in, he starts yelling at my dad, what are you doing? Why are you beat Frankie's really late? You know what? You're losing it. You're losing it. You're not the brother I knew. I'm out of here. He runs out and leaves me in there by myself. My dad, a moment later, jumps off me, goes and comes back with a towel. Now he's good, dad. Son, wash your face and hands. I don't want to be here. I don't like doing this book work. Plus, you can't be late for work. And I'm looking, thinking, who is this man? And he was good at reading people. He told me, he said a few days later, he said, don't do it. Don't do what? Don't run on me. The world ain't big enough. I'll find you. <laughs> Holy shit. How, how old are you at this point right now? I was in my... Uh, Early 30s, early oh, wow. 30, 31. Now, this was the kicker. Things got really bad between me and my dad. And I started breaking away from him. When I say breaking away from him, I would run and hide. I'd avoid him. I wasn't doing anything any for him anymore. And because uh, when my kids were born, you know, my son was born premature. And I'm looking, I'm like, what's my legacy going to be for my kids? Do I want to keep doing this? My stuff makes me, I'd rather take my family and move to another state and work three legitimate jobs. So my dad knew that I didn't want to do this anymore. My dad knew I didn't want to be around him. He looks at it as a sign of disrespect if you say no. And also, if they can't control you, if he can't control you, he calls you wild and says you're disrespectful. So one day he calls me, he says, son, let's get together you know, we, we got to work this stuff out. Now, me thinking, you know, at this point, I have some restaurants and stuff, and I got stuff going that 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 he's going to get together. We're going to work this out. And, um, you know, maybe he'll leave me alone. You know, we could be a father and son. So he says, come on, meet me for coffee. Meet me by the park. I go by the park. Come on, we'll take my truck while I take two. I hop in his truck on the way there. He goes, hey, he goes, we were passing one of these garages we owned a few blocks away. He goes, hey, you got your keys? I got to run in there for a second and grab something. I said, sure, Dad. Tell him a funny story or laugh when we get there. I said, I'll take a walk with you. Open the door. I open the door. All of a sudden, 
The door slams. I turn around. Bam, he's got me by the neck. He's got a gun in my face. And um, it's like that glassy eyed look. Yeah, I'd rather have you dead than you keep this obeying me. I can't control you. You're uncontrollable. Oh, no. He set me up. I was thought I was too smart to be set up. Anybody could be set up. He wants to kill me and bury me somewhere. My kids will never find me. I started crying. I tried hugging him. I wouldn't break the eye contact. I'm trying to kiss him, and I'm using trigger words. Dad, daddy, I'm your son. My kids, what are you doing? Guys, I don't know how or why I got out of that garage that night. He put that thumb back, and we got out of the garage. You know, going back to the truck, we get in the truck, and I could see that he's starting to get mad that he didn't finish it. Every once in a while, he backhand me to the face. I was so heartbroken and in disbelief, I didn't even raise my hand. He always said, don't ever pull a gun on somebody and not use it. It'll come back to bite you in the ass. I went back and got that gun. It was a 38 stum, those five shot revolver. I carried it in my pocket every day. I said, can't trust my dad no more. Now, that was in 1995. I was 35 years old. Government. That's got to be so tough that to be that age and have to be that age and be treated that way. I was like, because at that point, you're, you're a man as well. You're, you know, you're in your 30s and, and your dad's still controlling you and treating you like you're like a little boy like that, that would, I, I would imagine that'd be super tough it was and the point was I was starting to lose that fear of him a little bit and I was starting to get ready to stand up against him because really I had nothing to lose the man I didn't look at him as my dad anymore you know on a daily basis he's changing always unconditional love you're always hoping maybe you'll snap out of it you know I'm walking around with a gun in my pocket you know and when you're in this life you know, you get numb to a lot of stuff. And then you got criminal justification. You start justifying why you can hurt somebody or what you do that's not right. It was a rough time for me. How long, um, how long did you have to, I guess, live with that anxiety kind of like where you had that gun on you all the time? And did you think that you were going to run into him often? Yeah. Like what was your thought process after that? Yeah, I, I uh, he actually came to my house one day to try to talk to my wife. He came... Surprise! I jumped out a second floor window in the back onto the roof and took off. Did you really? You know, so there was, a, you know, again, I we could be here for three hours. There's tons of stories. A lot of them are in the book of, you know, a lot of stuff. And remember, I'm not a victim here when I tell this story. I did a lot of stuff wrong, okay? It was about survival. It wasn't about finding God, doing the right thing. It was about survival. Okay, my whole family, we were all scared of my dad. Took me to 37 years old in prison to finally lose that fear and stand up to him. Everybody always hoping, oh, something will happen. Maybe he'll, you know, go back to the guy we used to know. It wasn't going to happen. Uh, you know, my uncle, uh, right after the Spalachos got killed, there was a guy that my uncle, my dad worked with, a made member of the mine, John Ficarado who had done a lot of shady things when they were in Vegas with the hit team and some of the stuff he did to my uncle too. My dad was really mad about that. And then when later on, John went on the street up to somebody that owes $500 a week and put a gun to his head and said, quit paying the calibreses, you pay me. When my dad found out that he had enough, and this was a family friend, they killed a lot of guys together too. So my dad went and talked to his boss and they said, um, you know what, we've had enough of him. He's broke too many rules. You get the order. My dad gets the order. My uncle gets the order. When my dad comes back, he's concerned. This guy's very street smart. If my dad and my uncle are with him, his guard's going to be up. He always carries a gun. This is why I stuffed up. This was going to be my first murder. And I says, Dad, let me do this. This is about family. It's not about the mob. Let John. And my dad was like, what? I said, let, hear me out. Let John think that you want him to be my mentor. I'll go with Uncle Nicky in the car. You know, we practiced. I was ready to go. This happened in September of 1986. And two weeks before we were supposed to do it, my uncle steps in and says, I'll do it alone. John's guard will be down. My dad's like, huh? He goes, Frank, listen to me. I'll do it alone. My dad went along with him. When I got along with my uncle, I go, what are you doing? Don't you think I'm ready? Don't you think I'm capable? He starts laughing. He goes, you're more than ready, more than capable. Then why, uncle? Why are you pulling me out of this? He said, I'll tell you why. You see your father, we don't know who he is no more. You see how bad the mob's getting paranoid, killing each other. I go, yeah, government's getting stronger. This is no good no more. You're not crossing this line. You got too many, too much stuff going on in life. To, to, you need to be done with this. You're out. That was a big turning point in my life. I was mad at my uncle. Okay, 
for a long time, but really he saved my life. He sounds like he was very protective of you. He was, you know, he's seen, he was very protective of me. Um, he was like an older brother to me, my two uncles. And then he was very, very close with my middle brother, Kurt. Um, they, they were very, very close. And um, yeah, you know, and you know, my dad used to get jealous sometimes because he thought my uncle was trying to be our father. And we would just shake our heads thinking, where does he get that from? He's being our uncle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so my dad had a lot of phobias and problems too. But um, so in, in 95, when we got indicted, what I looked at is I had enough. I was tired. I, I needed change. Okay, I needed to straighten up. I needed to sober up. I needed to get away from my dad. I got wife and kids. So when we got arrested, I looked at prison for my way out. This is going to be my way out to change my life and get away from my dad. So I looked at it as a positive part. I was ready for it. I had had enough. So naturally, I pled out to the five years. My dad pled out to 12. My uncle pled out to seven. My brother, brother pled out till two. You know, all the guys pled out to two and three years because it was something new. You have a time stamp on it. If you plead out way ahead of time, and it's all not cooperating. If you plead out, um, uh, you get a lot of less time so you don't have to go to court. It saves the government money too, plus it's a victory for them. Oh. So one of the guys says, no way am I pleading out. They offered him three years. He fought it. He lost. He got a 10-year sentence. Wow. God. Yeah. Government 90, I think it's 96% of the time they win in court, the federal government. Do they really? I would not want to go against them. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> That's Chris. So when, um, when you started to make that decision of... To write the letter? Yeah. 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 Yeah, walk us through that process, your sure. thought process there. And sure. That happened. So when I got in prison, I went downtown to MCC, Metropolitan Correctional Center. That's where... Um, El Chapo was. It's maximum security when he was in Chicago. And R. Kelly's been there off the knot. In fact, R. Kelly thought it was safe enough for him to go in general population, and they stabbed him right away, and he went right back into protective custody. <laughs> so it was an active place. It, um, the next day I woke up, I felt like a million dollars. For the next six months, everybody had reported to their prisons. For the next six months, I was at this MCC, and you don't stay there forever. OK, they change for you out because it's it's a holding center for court. And if you got less than a year or two, they'll put you in there, too. Um, the list goes up on the door one day and it says Milan, Michigan, outside Detroit. I go to my counselor. Counselor, that's my dad on that list. Where's my name? When am I going to where I go? He looks, he goes back. He goes, I got good news for you. I go, what? It was every once in a while the Bureau of Prisons puts family members together. You're one of the lucky ones. You and your dad will get to do your time together. Oh, God. I did one bad day in prison. One bad day. It was that day. I freaked out. I didn't know what to do. He's going to ruin everything. I don't want to be around him. I still feared him at this point. Okay. Well, you know, there's nothing I could do. So now you hop on um, Con Air. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the Nicolas Cage movie. I flew on Con Air. It's not as Hollywoodish as you see. I, I diesel therapy on a bus. I wind up in Terre Haute Penitentiary. And, um, Transportation shuts down for the holidays and the, the plane kept breaking down. So I was in the hole for 16 days. And basically you're locked down 24 seven, you get fed through your slots because if they do that in transportation, it's a safety thing for everybody. You know what I did, I dug down deep inside. I lost the fear of my dad finally in my life. I'm at the bottom, but don't get any lower. I'm gonna go to Milan and I'm gonna work on my relationship. So six months down, I get to my island, and for the next eight months, I'm working on my relationship with my dad. But this, and what is that like? Pardon me? How do you start working on that when you're in prison? Slowly and cautiously. Yeah. We made promises to one another. Prior to going into jail, I came clean with my dad that I had partied because I wanted to get this drug and alcohol program in prison that you get 18 months off your sentence for. So he, pro he, he asked me to promise him that I would never party again. And I kept that promise till this day. I'll always keep that promise. I asked him to promise me when I go and finish my time that I'm going to go home and I'm going to run my restaurants and be a family man that he would never pull me back in no matter how much he needed me. And I also told him to promise me that we're going to work on our relationship because you tried to kill me. I know, I know. I'm sorry. Yes, we'll work on it. Okay. 
We hugged it out. We went to prison. I wanted to make sure my dad was going to keep my word, his word, because I was keeping my word. After a few months in prison, I'm doing really good time. You know, I got a job in the commissary. I'm working out every day. Guys from all their mob families, Boston, New York, Detroit, some guys from Italy, Chicago. They're all seeing the good time I'm doing. And one day, some of them tell my dad, hey, Frank, your son, he's always looking out first in the commissary, getting us fresh fruit and stuff. Uh, man, he does really good time. What guy should do time like him? You should be so proud. My dad goes off on them. What do you mean, my son? That's me. I'm the one that does the good time. He's doing it because of me. And they're looking like, what's wrong with this guy? And when I heard that, that bothered me. Okay, manipulating. Then he found out because when I went into prison, me and my wife got a divorce. We are very close to this day, but, you know, she was scary. He found out we were divorced. He thought she was the wedge. He started bringing me, wanting to try to bring me back into this. And I seen it and I was feeling it. And I, my stomach was turned. I was so upset. He was not changing in prison at all. It was the same old man that I always knew. It had been a very hard realization once you even tried working on it for so long and you thought you were making progress. Yeah, it had nothing to do with time. It had nothing to do with time. So after eight months, 14 months, I'm sorry, yeah, 14 months down, okay, I finally decided I had enough. I went out in the yard one day and I said, Dad, I got to talk to you because things are really bad. People could see it. Because I said, I don't fear you no more. Yeah, I kind of got that. I go, you're a piece of crap. What? You tried to extort your own son, Kurt, at Tony and Tina's wedding. My brother owned part of a play that ran in Second City, Tony and Tina's wedding, ran in New York, uh, Vegas, L.A. My, bro my dad, I said, Dad, you sent guys in there to extort your own son. He would have gave you a check if you wanted it. I didn't. Frankie, somebody's lying and manipulating you to get in front of our, and in between our relationship. I said, no, you're manipulating me. I seen it on a camera. Who had cameras? I said, nobody, Dad. You sent two idiots. They went under the security camera at Second City. Me and Kerr watched the tape. I'll be right back. I got to go to the bathroom. I know what he was doing. He went back. He came up with this fabricated story. Came back all lies. When, when, when I left at that point, I was done with the Well, my bigger deal. Sometimes in life, you got to make decisions and all your choices suck. I came down to two. And this wasn't something overnight. This was long thought out. So I wait till I get on the street and face him. Man, this guy's killed at least 13 guys. He's good at killing. I might not fear so well. And he didn't kill me in the garage that night. So I don't, morally, I didn't think it was right to try to kill him. So what I did was, I, I said, I want to keep him locked up forever. How am I going to do that? You know what? I'm going to get a hold of the FBI. Well, wait, hold it. The worst thing you can do in my neighborhood is be a rat, be a snitch. Most guys, they're going to cooperate. Usually it's because they got jammed up again. They're looking at some big time or they can't go to their time in jail. Neither one pertains to me. So I says, you know what? I'm going to offer them a business proposal. I don't even know if they're going to take it or not. I don't even know if they're better or worse. I just don't want to be obligated to anybody. I want to get my dad out of my life. So I went to the prison library. I wore winter gloves for fingerprints. I typed it for no handwriting. I didn't put nothing personal in there, and I sent it out to them. Basically, in a letter, it just said, hey, I want to talk to you. Nobody could know, not even my lawyer. I, I have a business proposal for you. Uh, don't bring recordings. Just bring pen and paper. I feel like I have to help you keep this sick man locked up forever. And I sent it out, not knowing what was going to happen. And how long after that did you get a response from them? It took some time. It took months and because of legalities and stuff. First of all, they, they thought it was, you know, wasn't sure if it was real at first. But then, they, you know what? When, when they got it, what they were thinking, they told me later on, was that I was having a hard time with my time. And they wanted to get out there, get me in front of a grand jury. So if I did say anything, I can't change my mind later, you know. So, um, or I'd incriminate myself. So when they came out, they brought the prosecutor. It was a lifelong prosecutor. He sat down and said, after five minutes, he went back and told him, don't put this kid in front of a grand jury. He's doing good time. This is 20 years in the making. This isn't something over. And I just finally had enough of what his father's done to his life and is trying to continue to do to his life. So they never put me in front of a grand jury. Now, naturally, they asked me, what do you want? Everybody wants something. I said, this is what I want. 
no disrespect to you guys, but I don't want to be obligated to you guys. I'll do all my time, pay all my fines, no immunity, but I'm only helping you against my dad. Wow. So that's how it started. There's a lot of people out there that don't know my story that think that I got, that I, I got time off and that's why I did it, that I was spoiled by my dad all my life and I couldn't do my time. And it was the farthest thing from it. All those mob boss bosses and high rate guys from all those cities will tell you how I did my time. I never suffered one day in jail. Street guys don't suffer in jail. You know, suffers your wife, your kids, your mother. Those are the ones that suffer when you're awake. And so, and so, did you did you face any sort of like disrespect or consequences from people who were also part of that life, or was it just people outside of it that had thoughts on it or, or whatever? Well, people that were part of that life, they you know naturally you know you, you cooperate with the feds. You know, you're dead to them. Okay. Uh, years right. later, in 2017, when I come into Chicago, you know, there's people that would say, I don't agree with what you did, but I understand I worked with your father. I know what you and your brother went through and your uncle and I, you know, I understand. Some guys even told me, Frank, most guys are into legitimate stuff because the trial took mostly everybody down. He says, you know, things are a little nicer now. These guys ain't over our backs, taking the money out of our pockets, even though we're legit. And then if we don't pay them, they kill us. So, in a, in a morbid kind of way, I did a favor for some people to get a guy like my dad off the street. Remember, I only cooperated against my dad. This opened up the doors. While I was in mm. prison wearing a wire against my dad, the reason my dad spoke to me was as I made him thought I wanted back in, and I was doing such good time that he wanted me back in. Mm. That, was, that was six months after, right? This was, this, um, this was, this was, uh, so what was six months? Me when I started wearing the wire? Well, yeah, well, yeah. How long after that? I was in 14 months, and then they came out. This was this was in 98 sometime. Okay, so, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So there was a lot of time in between that. But when I did decide, it was after the FBI came to see me that day. And they asked me, do you want to wear a wire? I says, in prison? No way. My dad's too smart for that. He, he caught guys twice on the street. I says, no, I'm going to feed you information, point you in the right direction to get my dad. I thought about it. And I told them a couple of weeks later when they came back, my dad's such a master manipulator. If I don't give him his own words, he'll get out of this. So I'll wear a wire. How am I going to make yeah, what him was dad like? himself? Were you nervous when you wore the wire the first day? Do you remember what you were doing or no? I, I remember exactly what I was doing from the day. I remember when I made a decision. It wasn't at an overnight decision. This was a war. Okay. I was all in. Okay. It was either me or my father. Okay, but this man that was my father is not the father I knew when I was growing up. I had to make sure before I contacted the FBI that I tried everything I can do to make this work. I, I just don't have fear. Okay, I respect what guys are capable of, but I just don't have fear. And I knew it was a job I had to do. That's what my dad seen in me when he brought me into this life. So now I'm just using against him. And what I did was I knew he wanted me back in and it broke my heart because I went and I says, hey, I says, we got issues to work out. I'm willing to work it out one more time. I got some major issues with you, dad. We don't work these out. You're dead to me. But if we do, I've decided I want back in. When I get out, I seen his eyes rise a little. The first time I met him with a wire, a little time into our conversation, he says, I'm so happy that you decided to come back in with me. You, you are going to take over the crew with Ronnie when you get out on the street. You've earned it. Good time you did in here. And then he gives me the name of the first guy he wants me to kill as soon as I get out. Jesus. That's how I got my dad starting to talk. And then anger and liquor get people to talk. My dad was mad at my uncle. My dad was mad at my brother. My dad was mad at the world. So I used my uncle against my, my dad. I said, Uncle Nicky said you killed an innocent woman in the Dauber murder. What's with that, dad? Innocent and a woman? That's not what you told me this life was about. He said, what, Frankie, I was in a lookout car and she wasn't innocent. But did he tell you about the innocent guy he killed in the half and half murders in Cicero? I got my dad so mad. He's talking about all this stuff on tape that he actually went one step further and put a hit out on my uncle in another prison. Did he really? No way. On, on his own he brother? Got word to the guys that were in there that killed with my uncle that there's another problem coming up and he's not going to stand up. I give you my blessing. You do what you need to do. It's the same thing he's sending. And they did, why, try. Why? they did try. It all got blotched up. 
And, but they tried. And then my office started cooperating. That's what opened this door to this whole case. The so, recordings on the yard with my dad, it's about, it's about um, me taking over the crew. So all this stuff is incriminating. Wow. My God. That's okay. Nuts. So I'm, I'm super like interested in the, like the idea behind all these as every hit associated with like payment is every hit for money. Are you or saying do like, people do, do it out of principle? Yeah. yeah do people get paid to do it? Like, what's like the behind the logistics behind some of these hits? Cause I'm always curious about like the, and does it happen as often as it does in the movies, you know, where everyone makes one wrong move and then they get killed the next day type of thing. No, no. First of all, if you're a customer, we're not going to hurt you and kill you like in the movies. Some people might, but we were, we were more business. Like we're going to try to figure out if I hurt you, how are you going to go to work? Yeah. That's what yeah. I always, you're trying to find a movies. solution. You want to make sure they can pay you someday. Yeah. That makes, that makes right. a lot of sense. Right. People yeah. get killed. Like I said, if you're dealing with drugs and you're breaking rules that you're not supposed to do, um, people get killed, uh, for stealing money, yes. Uh, people get killed for killing other people without permission. There's rules, but you're given chances depending on what you've done. Mm. But there's a lot of different reasons. Look, these guys were old school. The world was changing. There was this guy that had a trucking company, okay? And he was paying, I think, like $2,000 a month to the mob, okay? And he, I figured out something to bring produce back from California or something like that. Anyways, the guy sat down with these guys and he said, his name was uh, Cagnoni. He lived out in, in Hillside, um, in Hinsdale. Uh, Lions in Hinsdale. Anyways, it's one of the murders in the book. This guy goes and says, hey, look, I can't keep paying you cash. I have to start paying you by check. No, 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 no. You're not paying us by check. We take cash. That's the old school thinking, right? But at this time, the world is changing. Look, I'll pay you even more money if you want more money. Set up a, a shell corporation. Set up this. He's telling them all this stuff that most people do. Sophisticated criminal organizations do not. These guys said no. So he stopped paying. Hired a bodyguard. Got a, a bulletproof vest. They blew up his car on the on-ramp on Ogden Avenue getting on the tollway with him in it. The body was all over the place. So he got killed because he didn't want to pay no more because he couldn't pay cash, but he was willing to pay check. <laughs> but they, what, what exactly was he paying for? Which, it was a protection tax. It's extortion. You pay protection. A lot of people say, well, who are you protecting us from? Well, actually, we're protecting you from us. Oh, okay. Jesus. Can you walk us through like when you, if you're going into a new business, right back in the day and like, what, what's that interaction? Like when you're, you know, you're trying to extort them for this for the first time. So I'll give you one that was in the book. It, it's, it's uh, simple. It was extortion 101. You guys know Connie's pizza? Yeah. Okay. Connie's pizza owner was a friend of my dad's. So he's making a lot of money now, and he's got his first place down in Chinatown. My dad, he, he actually put my dad on as a supervisor of drivers just so my dad could show employment. Hmm. One day, a couple guys come in from somewhere, Italian guys, they don't know why, probably Detroit, and they come in and they say, hey, you got to pay us $200,000 and $1,000 a month, or we're going we're gonna to burn, burn your business down and hurt you. We'll be back in two weeks to collect the money. So this guy's scared. Now he's got an idea what my dad does. So when my dad comes in a couple of days later, he tells my dad, can I talk to you? What's up? He tells him what happened. My dad said, have you been bragging about the money you're making? He says, no. He says, have you been flashing money? No. Well, who did you tell all this money you're making? All I've told was my wife and you, nobody else, Frank, I swear. He says, okay, let me check and see if it's real. My dad comes back a short time later and says, Jimmy, it is real. These guys are dangerous. But... Because you're my friend, instead of paying two hundred thousand, you only have to pay a hundred thousand, and instead of paying a thousand dollars a month, you only have to pay five hundred. And the best part about it is, you don't have to see those guys ever again. Just give it to me, and I'll pass it along. For years, Jimmy thought my dad did him a favor. He paid the money until the trial came, and he found out my dad was behind the whole thing. Wow! <laughs> Holy, Holy shit. shit! That's nuts. That is. 
That is nuts. Yeah. It's clever. So that, <laughs> yeah. that <laughs> clever. talk about innocent people, nothing happens. That's only in the movies. Okay. Innocent people do wind up as collateral damage at times. Yeah. Now, do you think they would have, you know, like, would they, ha- if he did not pay and he didn't even go to your dad, do you think they would have actually come in? And, Those were his and guys. Help? Well, so I'm saying, like, yeah. would they have actually Those, been well, real well, they about were it? Actually, we had close ties to Detroit. So you bring in a couple of guys from Detroit to go in there and do it so nobody knows who they are, so it's not tied back to you. Jeez. It's insane. <laughs> and what do you think is your... Because well, I'm always very curious about, like, the evolution, right? As you said, this is, like, a, it was a changing thing back then, right? <laughs> Things are getting more sophisticated. The world's advancing. What's, like... The mob, is there, like, what's the mob like today, right? It's like, compared to back then, like, well, is it different now? you got to understand that, you know, at one time there was a Jewish mob. At one time there was an Irish mob, okay, over the years. When people come from another country, they don't speak the language. They come in the same neighborhood, and this, this you, you have these criminal organizations, okay? And then the idea is to move up and away from this, go more legit, you know, make a better life for your kids. So for the Italian-American mob is pretty much done in this country. The few places that there's still some left, like New York and the East Coast, but they're all on life support, okay, for a lot of reasons. Most people either moved on, they died off, they didn't recruit because a lot of people didn't want to go, you know. When you start seeing this violence and everything, you guys are saying, so if I make a mistake, am I going to get killed? Well, some guys, there's also paranoia. Guys get killed because people are paranoid, too. Guys that didn't do anything wrong get killed because people were paranoid. So you're like, gee, do I really want to do that? I can go out like $150,000 a year and hardly work. Don't have to answer no violence. So there's always going to be organized crime wherever there is large amounts of money to be made. It's just a game change. The players change, okay? And it's a little different now because most of the stuff we did is all legal. The government's running it now, right? You got payday loans. You got uh, sports gambling, you got pot being so it's lottery, everything, a lot of stuff we used to do, the government does not. Um, so, you know, also the government has a lot of weapons. If you have organized crime stamped on your file, you, you're going to do a minimum of 10 years, okay? You can lose everything. And your attorney started $250,000. So is it really worth it? But the criminal organizations now are Russian, Asian, cartel, uh, Middle Eastern, uh, those are criminal organizations. And, you know, you see uh, a lot of stuff out there. I mean, human trafficking, drugs still. Um, uh, uh, and they make all the fake purses and all that stuff, the fake watches. Those come from those countries, and there's a lot of money in all that. So there's always going to be some kind of criminal activity and criminal organization. It's just that the Italian-Americans or the Chicago mob, the cost of the Nostra is pretty much dark. A few guys Stop it there. But um, I would never say who they are, okay? Because one of the reasons I walk around, too, is it, it's not my business, okay? I, I'm not, I don't want to get in other people's business because maybe I might get chopped at in the back of the head if I did, so. You think there's still a risk of that even today with some of these guys? N- no, the only risk would be if I went to, a, when, uh, when I'm in Chicago, there's a lot of places I go. There's a few places I won't go because I know certain people go there. And I just want to show them the respect that, hey, look, I, I don't want to walk in somewhere and make somebody have to do something. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm in Chicago. Nobody's bothering me. I'm not in your pockets. Um, I'm, not, I'm not exploiting them. Okay, and I still show the respect that, hey, look, I don't, your business is your business. You're over there. That's not my place to go. What I yeah, wouldn't have to be concerned yeah. about is if I'm standing on one of the corners, flexing my muscles, <laughs> acting like a tough guy, acting like a gangster, some 18-year-old kid coming up and shoot me in the back of the head. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Stepping back to what we were talking about before, Frank. So you, after you do, you know, you wear your wire and everything. It, when, at what point does your dad find out about this? Right. My dad never found out. He almost he never found out one out. time because uh, I had a wire on. And I was wired up like a Christmas tree because the wires that they made for me didn't work. And he stepped mm-hmm. in to grab my shirt to see a tattoo that I had. And I had to step back, grab my shirt. I was able to talk my way out of it. And uh, so at that point, I was able to, the government wanted to get me out because, see, when I was in prison wearing the wire, they couldn't monitor me. With the concrete walls, when I left the office, I went to, first of all, if anybody seen me come or go to that office, I wouldn't know until I was dead in prison. 
And second of all, when I left that office with the wire, they didn't sit there and listen in and I had a safe word and there was a SWAT team yeah. waiting. I left. There was a recording. Either I came back or the prison alarm went off and I'm dead on the yard. So after about five or six recordings, when all this happened, government said we had enough. So I was able to get transferred down to Florida to take that drug program down there. And then I came home at the end of 1999. Did you ever have contact with your dad ever again after that? Or the no? last time I seen my dad was when I went to court. So with the wow. court, it wound up being the biggest case in the Chicago mob history in Chicago since the days of Al Capone. And one of the biggest reasons was the first time they ever had a made member cooperate against the mob, my uncle Nick. My dad tried to have him killed and he decimated the mob. He decimated the mob. Just to give you an idea, if you go all the way back to the early 1900s to 2007 at the trial, there was a little over 1,100 gangland slayings with only 14 convictions. In this case, there were 18 convictions and close to 30 murders solved with the government closed the books on. One of the murders that was also solved in this case and never made public was Sam Giancana's. Oh. What's that one? Who's that? Was that uh, someone in the family, someone uh, part of the life? Yeah, Sam Giancana was a Chicago boss for a while. It was a little bit before your guy's time, but it was big news. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he went all the way back because he was a driver for Al Capone at one time. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, so he got killed in the 70s. Wow. As, I'm curious, your relationship with your uncle, right? Does, it seems like he, you know, he, you know, he cooperated more. Does he go into like, witness protection? What was his situation kind of like? My uncle was in witness protection prison. He had time to finish out, but he did come home. He got out of witness protection and he just laid low in Chicago and spent time with his family. There was also a lot of people that liked my uncle. My uncle was not one of these social pets. He was, he was a, a, a soldier. You know, he, he volunteered for the Vietnam War. So he believed at one time in my dad. He believed in all this. He even believed in the mob at one time. He said, Frank, in the 70s, it was good. It was real good. He got into it in 1970. He said in the 70s, it was good. It got bad. Um, he lived with a lot of remorse you know, because of everything that he did. Um, but he got to spend time with his family. And, you know, I mean, the one thing that me, my brother, and my uncle all have in common is we broke that cycle with our kids. You know, my kids are 33 and 32. None of them have what we had in us, okay, or still have in you. It doesn't leave you. And, um, you know, so just happy I broke that cycle. My uncle did you guys, died last year. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry to hear that. that. Did you guys stay in touch? Me and my uncle, so when this first went on, my uncle sent a message to me through one of the FBI agents, tell Frankie I love him, I understand, and I'll see him when I get home. He got a little more time than he was hoping for, and he was mad at me at first. And we, we you know, my brother had communicated back and forth, and we had talked about getting together, and we did. We only got together one time. We were going to get together again and just never happened. I wanted it to. I believe he wanted it to, but it just never came about. So, um, you know, it, it was tough. I mean, we were ripped apart as a family. We're, we're still working on it all the time. Um, you know, it's affected my, my brother, Kurt, big time, what my dad did to him. Uh, he did what, he, what he did to him for child abuse is way worse than anything he did to me, you know, shorter when he yeah. tried to kill me. So, you know, he would try to get in your heads and he would basically screw with you. And, um, and it's tough, you know, when, when man you idolize and you, you know, and you respect, this, this, this happens to you. I and you said he was doing this with your brother too. It, did he, was your brother part of the life or did he stay away from it? No, my brother pretty much stayed away from it. But when I was separating from my dad, so my brother did some of the family legitimate business Sure. And um, well, he didn't do any of the street stuff. And uh, he, when I didn't, when I was running from my dad and hiding from my dad, my dad pulled him in to start doing some collections and stuff like that. You know, so he was trying to. My my brother was really having a hard time with my dad with that because you know he worked for the union, he had a good job, he had businesses, you know, all that, and it's not what he wanted to do. And he got indicted in the case, and it was. Uh, and he should have never been. He could have beat it if he went to court to fight it. Oh, wow. Wow. It seems like that whole, <laughs> it's, it's crazy, like, looking back at, like, on it now for you, I feel like. But did you ever, 
it can, I, I, it's crazy to think about because like because you have that relationship with your dad and you figure out like okay like this guy is like manipulating me this is all this like it has to be like did you like ever step back sometimes by like should I really be doing this like this is my dad like did you ever have second thoughts with at some point or were you like finally just like snapped and done? Um, it was a process. When I bought into my dad and my uncle in my early twenties, I bought in a hundred percent. Okay. And you know, and, and it was what it was about. And then, you know, I get into my thirties and, um, yeah, things are changed. Actually at 28 years old, I got married and that's when things were starting to change a little bit. And it was a gradual process of, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know if I want to do this anymore. It's not fun anymore. It's not excitement anymore. And, uh, and my dad's changing. So it, the, the final straw was the day that I, I confronted him on the yard about my brother and I didn't fear him anymore at 30. It was 38 years old actually. It seems like how you tell that everyone that's, you know, reacted to it, they're like, I get it. Like, like they feel like they, they knew how your dad was. Like, I, man, I, I know how your father was. It, it seems like. You know, there's, there's a line, too, where, you know, when it comes to family, you know, you hear about all this abuse in families, right? And people are like, oh, my God, that's awful. You know, they should hang that guy or this and that, you know. But it's different when I step forward or my brother steps forward and we say, hey, my dad abused us. He manipulated us. He physically beat us at times when we were adults. He tried to kill me. So I should be able to do whatever I want legally, right? But no, some people are like, no, you're a rat. That's your father. How can you go against your father? Well, wait, quote, because it's a mob thing, it's okay? You know, and this is what I'm trying to tell you. That's why I say my, family, my story is a family story. When when do you erase that line? I mean, when do we need to draw that line in the sand? Enough is enough. Whether we're family or not, if you're not going to treat me right. I went to jail for you. And I just don't want to do this anymore. You want to come and work with me at the restaurant? I'll pay you good money. I don't want to be in this life. It's not me. My dad used to always say, you're too nice. I said, what, do you mean I can't handle myself? I said, no, Frankie, you can handle yourself. You just got to be meaner. I said, yeah, that's not me. I like to be nuts. If there's a reason not to be nice, I says, that's fine. But I like everybody until you give me a reason not to like you. And I want to be fair with people. Mm -hmm. Maybe this wasn't for me. Yeah, you had to sacrifice a lot making that call. So Yeah. I can't, I can't imagine. So, And it sounds like you're still figuring that out to this day with you know, the resolutions like you mentioned and everything like that. So, well, yeah, nothing I did was spur of the moment. So it was all fought out. Can I live with, and I can't live. It doesn't make it any easier. That was my dad. I loved him. I yeah. hated his weight. We had a chance in jail together to work everything out. He had more money than God. He and my brother had businesses going. I'm in jail, straightening my life out. You know, I want to get out. I want to hit the streets again. But when I say hit the streets, I mean, legally, I want to work. I want to, I want to build stuff. Let's do it. You got the money. You got your family. Let's be a family. Let's go out there. Enough of this shit. Yeah. And, and you made the right call. Like you mentioned, you have your kids now and they're not part of that. So it was the right call. So a lot of respect yeah. to you for making that call and sticking to it. And I mean, it takes a lot of balls. Oh, um, it's another thing one thing the I, guys in the streets say, you know, I don't agree with what you did, but you got some balls. Yeah, um, that's a, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. It's just, you know what it was? It wasn't doing the right thing. It wasn't about balls. It was about survival. I needed the tour. Yeah, and the way I see it, like it was, it was also about, about your future family too. Like you mentioned, you know, you wanted to break the cycle and everything like that. So you were yep. thinking about more than just yourself too there. So you mentioned we, earlier. Go ahead, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. You mentioned earlier about, you know, it's, it's hard on your, your mom, your wife, your kids. Um, you know, what did your wife at the time know what was going on? Did you have to hide it the same way your father hid it when you were oh, yeah, young? I was going like, to ask, was, was, she, that relationship was she the voice like? in your ear kind of like, yeah. you know? So women are not supposed to know anything in this life, and it's not disrespect or they can't handle it. It's for safety. That's how it was always taught. It was for safety. Okay. And so my wife, her famous words, well, my ex-wife, her famous words were, how bad could it be? She was going to start dating me. She liked me. And the girlfriends were like, well, you know, the dad controls him. You know who his dad is, you know, and he's always with his dad. Oh, how bad could that be? So she thought I just ran some messages for my dad. When, once we got married and we started going, 
after a while, she started to see that I was dealing with the drugs too, because she, you know, she caught me partying a few times and she was totally against drugs. So that bothered her. She seen my dad and she was scared of him and she seen what he did to me. And that bothered her a lot. You know, when this was all over one day, she came up to me and she said everything. She goes, you know, I can't believe I had murderers at my table. She was, I can't believe everything. I thought I knew it all. Wow, this all went on around me. She goes, but I, I got to tell you. I go, what? She goes, I'm sorry. Well, sorry. She goes, Frankie, I used to give you a hard time all the time. You'd come home, sometimes your face was swollen from your dead beating. I'd say, what happened? You'd say nothing. I don't want to talk about it. You wouldn't tell me for my safety. And you had nobody to tell. How are you even saying today, I watched you go through all this? I said, look, we made it through. You know, we both have nice lives. We raised the kids together. That's what we have to look at. And my kids, they didn't know much, but when they were young and I wrote the book and everything and I moved out to Arizona in 2002, um, their mother told them, you know your dad now, but you need to find, know his story to realize what he went through to get to where and who he is now. And you'll understand a lot about your dad. You know, and, and they did. And, you know, we have a very close relationship with them. That's good. That's good. And, and how did... I guess I'm... Sorry. Your phone. My bad. <laughs> what I was going to say was, uh, how was your uh, your father's relationship with your with his grandkids, right? Was he it, was, it wasn't bad. I mean, it was. he didn't have much of a relationship with them, but uh, they were really young. They were really young. I thought yeah. he would have had more of a relationship with them, but it wasn't the dad that I had when I was young. So for him, it was, there wasn't there too much of a relationship. I, 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 we probably touched on this, but what was like, what do you think the flipping point was, right? Cause he's getting, was it just him getting older, more paranoid? Like what was it that made him kind of change? Um, the street. Yeah. The street, all the pressure, all the killings he did, beatings he gave, everything he went through, it just took a toll on him as he got older. And then in the eighties, um, he, he had a tumor in his pituitary gland, so he had to have surgery and that affected him a little. And then not too much longer after that, he had both heart valves replaced. So, you know, I think everything took a toll off. Slowly knocked him down. Yeah. But, you know, when also kind of when you were growing up too, when you were part of it, were you meeting a lot of these guys, um, other made men, bosses? Was it a pretty close group, or were you very isolated with your dad, your uncle, and just kind of the crew in the neighborhood? Like, how, how does that work? Um, I was, it's, it's kind of isolated. I, met, I mean, I met other guys. I knew a lot of guys because you'd say hi to them, but I'm not a made guy. could never be a made guy. I'm half Irish, nor did I want to be a made guy. And you just can't walk up and start talking to business to guys and stuff wow. like that, you know? Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of doings and people are at, you know, weddings, graduations and restaurants in the area. You walk up, you say hi, you give a hug. Okay. And what made you uh, want to write the book? Did you always have that in mind, right? As you were uh, like when you were in jail or what no, made you want to do no, that? No, no. Um, in 2000 and I believe it was 2010 or the end of 2000, I think it was September of 2009, the FBI got a hold of me and said, Frank, we're doing this speaking engagement in California for the Department of Justice for the state of California. We want you to come and speak with us. I go, what? Speak with you? These guys want to hear about it. Guy that told on his dad, that's not your story, Frank. So I went to speak. I never spoke in front of people before. And I got in front of a room of about 800 people. I started speaking with them and it went really well. And uh, I was told I did really well. And then some writers met me there and they wanted to know if I would be interested in writing. And I says, I don't know. So we went back and forth for a while. I wasn't sure. And then when I decided to do it, you know, I told him, I said, this is his family story though. That's what I want. You know, and I don't want some mob book, just mob book. And so we agreed and we wrote the book and then it came out 2011. And then I started getting more speaking engagements and I just started, you know, I was on Nightline and Bill Wurz like, have you ever talked publicly before? No, you should. You're good. And so one thing led to another. And I still work. I mean, I've been working for Marriott since the, the day of the trial. I worked for Lifetime Fitness and Sales. 
I consulted on a couple of restaurants in Scottsdale, hope opening them. I had a little pizza place for a while. So I always work. This is not my, for, so this is the first time now being out at the Mob Museum in Las Vegas for the next six months that this is actually my only job, is public speaking. <laughs> What's that like now, like the the mob museum? It's like a, it's a residency thing, right? The, yeah, it's yeah. residency it, yeah. thing, which is what I like. I spoke there in 2019 before COVID, and I love the place. It's not just a mob museum; it's law enforcement. So it's not real cheesy. It's not real how you wish or anything. You know, they look for multiple sources to make sure they got the best truth. They got some nice archives there, and they're doing a lot of great stuff there. They're actually one of the top museums now in the country. You know, they've won some awards. So I was like, what can we do? What can we do together instead of me coming like once a year? So we finally figured out, he says, hey, what the museum doesn't have is somebody that actually is there telling a story that it's their story. They lit this life. And, um, and they like that. So I said, the only way I could do it is to relocate here for a while. So that's what I did. So far, three, four weeks in, it's gone great. That's awesome. That yeah, sounds really awesome. cool. Yeah, it sounds like an exciting gig, I would think. It is. How do you like Vegas? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a big Vegas guy. I don't. Yeah. I got rid of all my vices. So. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky though. Wow. It's zero degrees. Zero degrees here today in Chicago. Yeah, Chicago's yeah. trash right now. Yeah, I love the warm <laughs> weather, so that's why I like it out west here. Yeah. You know, if I want snow, I could just drive an hour to the mops. You get all the yeah, you want. There we go. It's the yeah. best of both worlds out there. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> so are you, um, I think we were kind of talking about it. I don't know if you could touch on it a little bit more, but you, you were working on a film at one point and maybe working on a show now. Are you able to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So let me, yeah. first off, Hollywood is way tougher than the streets. Okay. And the streets, they might beat it out of you in Hollywood and you <laughs> shake your hand, pitch on the back and take everything out of your pockets. I had my <laughs> rights stolen early on, got them back. Wound up hooking up with some good people in Hollywood that I'm still with now. And we had a project together. We had a screenplay done. And we had um, Ben Affleck was going to play my dad. Casey Affleck was going to play my uncle. And we were talking to Tom Holland about playing me. And then COVID hit and that thing fell apart. So we still had the screenplay. After COVID, we were getting ready to start going again. And then we hit the writer's strike. But prior to the writer's strike, Hollywood now is switching to streaming and I've always wanted a series because we have, I have 800 unpublished pages. Plus we have tons and tons of stories. So we put together a pilot and uh, we're in the process right now of talking to some actors and attaching actors. We're working with CAA and um, they're behind it. The pilot is excellent. I have a, uh, uh, a director named John Hillco, who is really into this project. John's done a lot of projects and he's also works with Taylor Sheridan on a lot of stuff. Sweet. So I have that's all awesome. good people. That's that's the Yellowstone guy, right? Or- yeah, but yeah, Taylor Sheridan's the Yellowstone guy. Oh no. Yeah. John did that's that cool. Taylor Sheridan that's on Paramount with the um with the spies, the female spies. Uh Nicole Kidman was in it. Uh, there was a few people. He did a Tammy Wynette thing on Showtime. He's did triple six uh, with a lot oh, yeah. of big actors. He's done a lot of stuff. So we got a good director. Um, and Dude, uh, I want to see that. I'm excited. I want to see I'm that pumped. so do you, bad. Do you think it's going to come to fruition? You, you got I, I'm doing everything I can. I've been going for years. I'll drive back and forth. When my daughter was living in L.A., I'd be on a couch. One day I'd be, I'd be uh, sitting in all the studios, walking on uh, NBC, Paramount, CBS, and the next day I'm back on my daughter's couch pulling my hair out. So I don't know. I got the right people. They're, um, uh, the guy that has my project, Jeff Rubinoff, used to run Warner Brothers, okay? So he's the lead guy. My producer is, oh. uh, is very well respected in Hollywood too, Brian Haas. Um, he used to run uh, Mike DeLuca's uh, studio, and DeLuca – has run all the big studios and he he did 50 shades of gray so he made so much money now you know he could do what he wants <laughs> he can do whatever he wants that's right. great that, that's a big team yeah i've wow. met a lot of people and i'm around the light a lot of people and they all see what i see the family story um you know it's kind of like sopranos what i've seen about sopranos was that the yeah. first time it showed you what happens to the family when yeah. they bring the street in the house okay <laughs> and that's why it was very successful it's not just the mob family it's his blood family too 
it's a deep storyline. It's not just, yeah, it's not just street life or whatever. It's yeah, a deep, if you're looking for the running around, shooting everybody up and who's the boss and the underboss and making ceremonies, all that, my mind would not be the one to watch. Yeah, uh, th- that sounds, I mean, that, that sounds like a show that we're all going to get hooked on. Oh, God, yeah. That sounds cool. So I'm on I really hope that you- <laughs> I wish we could do something to help. That'd be incredible. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a fantastic you, uh, I mean, you already got the crew, too, so. Yeah, I you mean, got some big hitters on that. Yeah, yeah I got the next Sopranos. people. And there's some big name actors that are trying to read for it, too. So um, uh, it's just that, you know, when in Hollywood's, it's really crazy. I've learned a lot. So it's not like who would be the best person to play me. It's like who's a good actor, but he has a good price over their head. Because when you go yeah. out and raise the money, that's what they look at. So you can have all oh, actors in there that are going to be great actors. It just makes it that much harder if they're not well known to raise the money for the project. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Like one of those middle pick? actors, yeah. really good and can and can bring in you know a good price on their head. Um, and, uh, you know, so you got a good deep script too. Well, Dom, this is your shot. If you want to do a reading real quick, yeah, yeah. Do a reading. <laughs> just send me the script. <laughs> Dom, this is your shot. It's Come my on. monologue. Yeah. Let's hear, let's hear it. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> That's incredible. That it's wild too, how you were saying that, uh, so does CAA connect you with all these individual people? I mean, how well, did you get in touch with all these people to no, do this No, the stuff? studio connected with CAA, the directors with CAA, my producers with CAA. Okay. We were working, we were working with, with Ben. I think we were working with William Morris and Deborah a little bit too. Yeah, it all depends. But, um, you know, there's, there's, it's all Hollywood connections. It has nothing to do with me. You know, so these yes, are the guys. You know, I lose <laughs> a lot of it, of um of control when you get when you get there, but I'm with the good people that I that I trust now enough to get this done. So is it like I've always been curious about this when it comes to stories like this? And is it like a statute of limitations thing, or is it like a you know kind of like just being easy with what you say? Are you ever worried about the stories you tell and incriminating oh. anyone or? So I, 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 are you asking me if I killed anybody? Which they- no, 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 no. With, with like incriminating anybody, like oh. even like people from your past, like, you know what I mean? Like there's maybe there's stories that people already know about, so you could talk about them, but maybe there's some stories that people don't know about, so you keep them to yourself. You I will I mean? not but talk about picture. anything that would, that would cause any problems for anybody. Yeah, I've always been curious about that. Like, you know, maybe you're, you're trying to <laughs> hold some really good stories back. He's like, man, that'd be good in the movie, but I can't say it. You know, that kind of thing. There, There's a lot of people out there that I could tell stories about, and they would not be happy with me if I did. And that, I don't want right. to be TMZ flesh in the pan, okay? My, there's enough of my story in the history of the Chicago mob in it that we're not, there's nothing. No, I'm not concerned about it because there's nothing I would, that anybody's asking me for that I would give. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You just kind of like share what's kind of already known type of thing or yeah. what, what you could. Maybe- well, there's a lot of my story that's not known. And, you know, this is okay, what I, I do when I tell it. And there's enough there that I don't need to go into somebody else's story. But yeah. them tell cool. respect. respect. That's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Incredible. Damn, wow. that, I'm, I'm, exci- yeah. I'm, I'm pretty excited. I really hope to, that comes through. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to hear about that and to, <laughs> to, to binge watch it. I like, I like the part that you're saying about like more of a family story because like you're it's like sing- Sopranos. Yeah, we, we love that it, show. But like so. Sopranos was, was very, it was, it was very like Tony's psyche and everything. I was yeah, like, yeah, that'd, that'd be definitely very that. interesting to dive into. His son, when his son went through all those stages, so confused. Yeah. He tried to be his dad, a mobster for a little bit. Then he was going to be an entrepreneur and, you know, he got the sports car and he was going to go to that. I mean, he just didn't yeah. know his place. Most people follow what they're, fathers did in life or something similar, you know, or a different family member or a family business, you know? Mm-hmm. So when you have this, you know, sometimes these kids get confused. You don't know what to be. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You're looking for a role model or looking for, yeah. Yeah. You're looking for a role model. Yeah. A lot of times if it's not your father, if it's not a family member, it's somebody that you might've been raised around, you know, that you just, you know, you were intrigued with what they did and, and you go into the business or they bring you into it. So it, it's sure. confusing. It's confusing. God, that's awesome. That's wild. Yeah. I mean, you've got an incredibly chaotic, but also uh, inspiring story, I guess, especially for people that are in, you know, not the same situation, but have situations where their fathers are extremely controlling and manipulative and trying to pull them back in oh, to you- whatever that may be legal or not. You know, I mean, I hope people can relate to that story and maybe find some, um, 
inspiration. Well, that's what I get. You know, when you read the cover of my book, Chicago's Murderous Crime Family, most women are not going to pick up a book like that and start reading it. And then after, sure. after they listen to my story, literally listen to hear me talk, they realize it's a family story. People can relate to this. I get a lot of people that say, I have problems with my family. They go through a bunch of cultures and, they, and they're not changing. And I don't know how to get out of it. And, 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 you know, I see your story. Maybe I got a chance. Yeah. It's incredible. You're helping more people now, too. Yeah, it's, if I could, that's great. Yeah, you know, somebody sees, maybe somebody sees my story and says, maybe I got all oh, you did it. You know, I tell people, it's not easy. Okay, it's going to be very hard because it's your family. I said, but just make sure that you're kind-hearted and you're doing the right thing and make sure you can live with anything you do. So don't do spur of the moment something that you're going to regret. Think it through, but don't give up. I love that. Awesome. I think, uh, yeah, that I was, think, what? I, I would say thank we were yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, I think we got a lot here and, um, thank you so much again for sharing your story. Yep. Uh, this has been an incredible conversation and, uh, you know, super excited for your book and obviously uh, for your, uh, hopeful new show. Yeah. And we're, uh, we're going to pick the book as well. Yeah. And where can everyone get the book and uh, book is on, um, Amazon okay. or you can go to my site, Frank Calabrese, junior, Jr. Uh, dot com. And you can buy it off of there too. And, and there's a spot in there if you want me to sign it. To, if they want me to sign it or write something in there, there's where you type in what you want. And I usually get it out there within uh, five working days. I use uh, USPS priority. Okay. Nice. Awesome. You can pay right well, cool. well, for everything. Well, thank you so much again. I really appreciate this. It's been a good conversation and uh, look forward to staying in touch with you. And um, yeah, thank you again. Yeah, we appreciate you and we want to hear about this show too. So. You know, Stay in touch. If, if we don't see if we don't see a press release for it or something, make sure you let us know that it's coming. <laughs> I will. Yeah, thank you guys. Yeah. I wish you guys a lot awesome. of luck. When we success. when we finish up here, Frank, I'm I'll, I'll end the stream and I'll tell you just one thing we have to do to finish it out so everything's good. Okay. 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 Awesome. All right, cool. guys. We'll see you next week and see ya. Peace. Thank Thanks. You.